And as people are starting to trickle in, we're, we're expecting a pretty high number of attendees today. We're already a little over 100. So um, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like to make some connections. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll give it about another minute. But yeah, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Hopefully you get uh, used to participating in today's event. We've got uh, some, some great channels for communications and in our breakout rooms, we're really hoping that uh, everyone here will be able to find ways to type and, and talk in their breakout rooms to, to give us some feedback and uh, contribute to this project. So hop in the chat, introduce yourself and um, we'll get going in just another minute. All right. Taylor, are you ready? You think we're ready to get moving? Yeah, I think we've got a, a great group of people to, to start with. And anybody who joins a little late and wants to catch the beginning will be sending the recording out. Wonderful. All right. Well, welcome, welcome everybody to the Experience U project kickoff. Uh, my name is Colin Reynolds, uh, senior education designer with the uh, Ed Design Lab. Uh, we've got a wonderful group of, of featured guests and speakers today that are, are excited to share their perspectives and interest in the Experience U project. Um, so we're going to get moving, uh, an overview of today's agenda, introduce our, our project team, our featured guests, and um, give you a sense of, of what we're excited to, to launch. Um, for today's agenda, we're going to walk through the introductions. Uh, we've got some opening remarks uh from jason tisco which is uh from the u.s chamber of commerce foundation uh we'll we'll move into a project overview with naomi boyer from the education design lab and then we've got uh two guests beth rudin uh, from bast ai who is a uh, an ai expert that's going to talk a little bit about the ethical use of ai um, and phaedra bonan idris uh who is leading some project work with ibm is going to talk about uh ai work in as um, in its relationship with curation to content. Uh, then we're going to overview the actual call for demonstrations and participation in this project sprint uh, before we launch into some breakout rooms uh, that will be facilitated by the Ed Design Lab team. And those breakout rooms are really meant for collection of feedback and rich conversation around all of the information that we're sharing about the Experience U project today. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have some report outs, open it up for some Q&A, and then talk about the next steps uh, in the Experience U project and timeline. Uh, first things first, this uh, Experience U project is a joint endeavor from the Education Design Lab and the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce Foundation that is sort of nested under the T3 Innovation Network. Uh, and this project has been made possible by funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, there are so many people that have uh, laid interest on this project from its conception all the way to this point, and we want to acknowledge all those different people. There, there are too many to name just to get here today, and the the hundred plus that are in the room right now. We thank you for this interest in your in this project, and we're excited for uh, what will unfold over the next uh, six months. This project team, as I mentioned, um, has been working on this for the last few months to release the project paper and the call for participation, which were shared with registrants um, earlier this week. Uh, we'll have links for those documents that will be shared throughout today. Um, but our team that has been working on this, uh, I mentioned Jason Tisco, uh, who will be giving some opening remarks. Um, Bob Sheets is a, a member of a fellow of the Chamber of Commerce Foundation, uh, and Taylor Hansen has also been um, project managing uh, along with members of the Education Design Lab, Naomi Boyer, the Executive Director of Digital Transformation, uh, myself, and uh, the one and only Phil Long, uh, who 
to say LER network facilitator feels like it's not giving enough credence to, to his experience and expertise in this space. Uh, but we're we're thrilled to to be presenting this project with you, and all of those individuals have a chance to to speak. In addition to some of our featured guests um, and speakers, which I mentioned, uh, also Kelly Page, um, Dr. Kelly Page from Digital Promise, as the director of Learning and Employment Innovations, she will be helping to facilitate a conversation in one of our breakout rooms around the ethical use of AI and what that means. Uh, so if if your interest hasn't been peaked yet. Uh, we're about to dive into it um, and give you some more information about this project. And to give our opening remarks, um, I want to hand it over to uh, Jason Tisco from uh, the U.S. Chamber. Thank you, Colin. And I wanted to officially uh, welcome all of you in attendance today um, to our, our first forum for Experience U. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the T3 Innovation Network. For those of you who, who might not be as familiar with T3, uh, the T stands for talent, the three for Web 3.0. Uh, it is a collective action initiative bringing together public and private partners, uh, and they include uh, employers, uh, employer associations, um, many folks on the education, training, and credentialing side of the equation, including colleges, universities, and K-12 districts. We have government agencies, and of course, the many technology vendors that serve them. So it's a, it's a network that's uh, near 2,000 professionals uh, who have come together around three big goals. Uh, the first, to make all learning count and to render that learning as data that can be transacted across our domains, to make competencies and skills like currency, meaning to not only transact them, but to translate them, and to, importantly, empower learners and workers with data. So as T3 has uh, been working on this digital transformation and data interoperability for a number of years, uh, we have been working to support the emerging LER ecosystem and we believe in the promise they offer the future workforce um, and is very consistent with the mission of T3 to make all learning count. However, uh, along the way, um, we have to uh, uh, confront um, a challenge, which is as we begin to implement LERs, we're mainly talking about the issuing of newly verified uh, records uh, to individuals. Uh, but if we're looking at kind of where we are as a country, if not globally, there's a lot of people already out there who have um, education, employment experiences, and other experiences in life, um, where nobody is going to be issuing them something new anytime soon. So the challenge of Experience U as a T3 project supported by a collaboration between the U.S. Chamber Foundation and Ed Design Lab is to really the meet, to meet the workforce where it's at today and to bring everyone's past forward through the use of AI and AI-related technologies. What that means is, for folks like you and me who already have a wealth of experience, how do we meet um, all of us where we're at, and through technology, be able to produce a standards-based, skills-based LER um, consistent with our prior experiences. And we think this is an important effort because if we're successful, we would be able to bring in millions of individuals into the LER ecosystem, and by scaling quickly, it would allow us to start changing behavior and technology. So with more and more individuals having skills-based, standards-based LERs based upon past experience, we think, for example, it could be a revolutionary step in supporting skills-based hiring. So um, that is the challenge before us. Can, through technology, we bring everyone's past forward and move large swaths of the labor market into the LER ecosystem? And we're excited to have this series of forums now to test whether or not we are there. And can it be done? And can it be done accurately? So I challenge this community to think, uh, about this. Imagine a world where in just a handful of years, should these demonstrations uh, prove successful, we can create up to 25 million self-asserted LERs with well over 250 million machine readable skills that are going to be benefiting and providing opportunity uh, to learners, workers, and employers alike. We don't think this is science fiction. In T3, we focus on what's feasible, and we believe this is a challenge worth taking up uh, and an experiment worth undertaking. So we are excited um, to work with Ed Design Lab um, and through the T3 Innovation Network to explore this opportunity on behalf of the American workforce uh, and beyond. Uh, and we think this will be a value added effort to all of the existing LER work that's already happening today as folks are exploring how to ver issue and verify uh, LERs for new experiences. So we wanna bring the old together with the new um, to really uh, make LERs a scalable innovation. Uh, I want to double down and provide my thanks to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for making this project under T3 um, possible. 
Uh, but I also want to thank our, our other funders who have supported uh, the T3 Innovation, Innovation Network, uh, most notably Walmart, um, who has made this current network of networks phase possible, uh, which allowed us to get to this point. So thank you to everyone who's contributed uh, to T3. And I want to thank all of those in the T3 network who have uh, made this moment possible. A lot of different folks have been contributing towards this concept uh, for a while. So we're really excited now to officially launch it um, uh, with the leadership of Ed Design Lab. And I wanna thank all of you, the audience for joining us today to explore this opportunity to weigh in. And I'm hoping many of you will opt into the demonstration to prove it out. So we will get to the call to action today, but I wanna say it's coming. Um, we don't want to just talk about it. We want to demonstrate it. So today we'll, uh, we will conclude with a call to action, and we hope many of you um, can establish partnerships that are going to prove this opportunity out. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. Uh, we look forward to your contributions today uh, and, and, and the forums that follow. And it's my pleasure to hand things off to uh, Naomi with Ed Design Lab. So Naomi, if you're ready, uh, the baton is yours. Fantastic. I think the next slide, actually, Colin, were you going to introduce some of the uh, presenters or do you want me to move right into my portion? Why don't you hop uh, right into your portion? Okay, you got it. Hello, everybody. My name is Naomi Boyer and I'm the Executive Director for Digital Transformation at Education Design Lab. I am so honored to be able to share the exciting new project that's underway that represents the partnership, and you heard this from Jason, between the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation and Education Design Lab, and inter intersects and connects with a number of the T3 networks that have been currently doing work over the years. Jason and I have been acting as the project champions and are really excited to have Taylor Hansen and Colin Reynolds expertly guiding the project uh, for the chamber and the lab respectively. In addition, we're excited to have Phil Long, Bob Sheets, and Daniel Saunders contributing as subject matter experts um, as we as for the entire process. And it is a truly a dream team uh, that we've been able to assemble. So we're going to go to the next slide. Um, Experience U is developing prototypes to empower all, each and every one of you, us, it's all of us, through access to an LER. It is hypothesized as part of this project that a readily available, scalable LER for all individuals will provide a means for opportunity seekers to display their skills, work experience, and talent through a digital format in the talent marketplace and for direct employment. Next slide, please. What is the problem that Experience U is solving for? Currently, LER efforts are focused on those enrolled or employed and records moving forward. Again, Jason kind of highlighted that. But what about the millions of individuals that were previously graduated or completed credentials? What about the documentation of credentials that are achieved via alternative learning or informal learning settings? What about the interests of those who need the promise of a skills-based LER the most? Those who are unemployed, underemployed, military connected, or otherwise not associated with forward thinking institutions that are developing digital records and deploying CLRs or LER documents. Experience U is all about enhancing skills visibility for the masses through digitally accessible, scalable tools that will be intentionally designed with equity and bias mitigation as core elements. What is the plan for carrying out this work? This forum is being held to build awareness about the white paper that we're releasing, introduce the concept of Experience U, and generate interest for the design teams to apply to participate in the effort. This phase of work is all about awareness and understanding. We appreciate all of you joining us on this journey as we kick it off today. Secondly, the team challenge is being announced to generate interest from forward-thinking organizations with technology solutions, AI, and LER expertise to forward the ideation, prototyping, and testing of a model that can be showcased nationally, I'd say globally. The question the teams will, will be answering, how might we use emerging technologies to take unstructured data about an individual and convert it to structured LER format that can be confirmed for accuracy and consistency. Of critical, critical importance in this work are prototypes that can scale. You keep hearing us say that, 
respond to the mass need and target per personas that can most benefit from the visibility of their skills. The third part of our plan process is the demonstration of the prototypes. This is being planned in conjunction with the T3 mid-year meeting in July. We look forward to convening in person to showcase what the teams have accomplished, and I'm hoping to see most of you there. Finally, this is just the beginning. As a function of this work, we hope to galvanize a community action and build a foundation for further phases of work. Essentially, the Experience You project is a strategy to build and test whether the development of an LER at scale is possible. The promise of Experience U is what we can learn about the value of an LER for equitable access, what works and what doesn't. The skills data belongs to you, or at least it should. Through this initial phase of work, we hope to develop an MVP that will lead to the empowerment of opportunity seekers to be able to curate, verify, validate, and showcase their own skills. Who is this for? Who is Experience for? It is for you. We've identified three personas to remind everyone that this work is not a technology, but rather is tied to the benefits for humans, individuals to showcase what they know and can do, employers who need talent. The technology is a means to serve a wide variety of opportunity seekers. For example, Maria is a 38 year old Hispanic incumbent worker employed in the supply chain and distribution industry. She's a single parent with two children under the age of 10. She coaches softball in the evenings and is looking for opportunities to advance at the company she works at, but is struggling to communicate her existing skills and the experiences she has gained from the eight years of work in this field. Antoine is a 56-year-old Black man who's worked as an electrical engineer. However, he never did get a, a degree. The company he worked for is closing his doors, and now he's left without a job and the credentials for others to gain insight into the advanced techno technological technical work that he was doing. And it seems as if every comp company that he seeks to apply for is looking for that degree and doesn't value the 33 years of experience he gained on the job in this field. And finally, Deanna is a white female military veteran. She's 39 years old and transitioned from the military after serving for four years. She held the rank of Sergeant in the Marine Corps and specialized in, in Motor T Operator and served some time as a, a legal chief for the regiment. She is passionate about facilitating job pathways for other veterans and has taken a number of alternative trainings and assessments to earn alternative credentials, hoping to showcase her skills. These and millions of others are examples of those that experience you can benefit. We will encourage our participating teams to establish a persona or personas upon which they are designing their solutions for, targeting those that can benefit from the ability to digitally confirm, validate, and share their skills, experiences, and accomplishments. We are a fast-moving, rapid ideation, design, develop, and testing project. Teams will be selected in the coming weeks and the team project work with technical and mentor support will begin in February. The final deliverable for this work will be a report that couples the initial content presented in the white paper with findings, prototypes, lessons learned, and a forecast of what is on the horizon for this work. Next slide. And the fact that you are here and attended this session is an indication of your interest. There are lots of ways to engage in this work. As a team member, we have the call for participation and instructions for applying, as well as the technical specifications available. Use the link or the QR code on the right-hand side of this slide in order to gain access to these docs. The teams can be assembled by you. However, the Experience You project leadership will also be making connections for those who may have a tech skill or or a technology that needs to be combined with others to form a team. So we're gonna be trying to do some, some of that matching. Additional technical review sessions will be scheduled in the coming month for those who have questions, but feel free to, air, to email Colin, our, our MC here with specific requests. And then you can see his, his email um, on the slide as well. Um, other ways to engage, connect as a project mentor or technical expert. The call for participation includes information on how to apply for these roles. Provide feedback on the project paper. And we are gonna be gathering some insights through our, our work, um, our breakout sessions as we have coming up in the session. 
Keep up with project progress by reviewing releases and participating in the technical demonstration in July. And above all, we are in this skills movement together. Advocate for, champion the movement, and facilitate connections in the LER and skills community. And with that, I'm actually going to pass it back, pass it on to Colin um, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, and my contact uh, email address was dropped in the chat, and we'll be dropping more links for the project paper and other documents throughout the meeting. Um, so our next speaker is Beth Rudin. Uh, early on in the conversations around Experience U, uh, Beth's name was mentioned, whether she, she her ears itched or not. Uh, we had a lot of conversation. We're thrilled to uh, bring her in to share a little bit about her perspective on the ethical use of AI and its relationship to this project. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Beth. Thank you very much. And thank you guys so much for having me. Um, you are one of my favorite groups of people and I absolutely adore that I get to talk about ethical use of AI. So I wanna start with um, just th this notion and this understanding that we have a much more profound mission. We borrow this world from our children and we need to do a lot of unlearning and reinventing in the next 10 years or so. So one of the things that I really wanna put in everybody's head is a proxy for understanding what we need to do with the advent of AI. And I'm sure most of you have heard by now that ChatGPT has been released. It was released in November of 2022. And I wanna tell a little bit of a story about in 1893, Chicago World's Fair, Edison and Tesla released electricity. What a lot of people don't really know about that is that all of that actually resulted in a fire and that fire killed about 16 people, but it was enough for people to say, oh my goodness, this, this needs to have some standards, this needs to have some processes, this needs to have some certifications, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can all make sure that we are doing this in a way that makes sense. And so if you think about the codes that need to be put in place, the standards that need to be put in place in order to be able to install an electrical circuit within your house and all of the building codes, as well as all of the certifications that need to happen for electrical engineers, that's what we are facing with. And those are the types of skills that we are going to be able to need to build in order to enter into this new world. So from my standpoint, um, November 2022 is the same thing that happened in 1893 at the Chicago's World's Fair. So what is ethical AI exactly? Data, which fuels AI as an artifact of human experience. I come by this definition incredibly intentionally because I want people to understand that data is biased and data is an artifact of some human that either put the data in the place or built a log file to out the data. The data is something that is an output or an exhaust of a human being's experience. And it is the choices that a human being makes that generates the data. All of that is biased. So when we hear things like the model is biased, the data is biased, there is bias in the data, Data is simply a reflection of our biases as social animals, as human beings. In order to understand this, we can then have the correct conversation of what are humans good at and what are machines good at. When we do that, we get to understand how we can use artificial intelligence as a mirror to understand who we are and how we can look at our own social bias. When we talk about ethical AI, we need to talk about ethics or the ethos or the atmosphere and the social nor norms that are persisting within our world. Currently, I'm asking the question, where are the adults in the room who we are to model the ethical standards that we can see and say, this is what ethical AI looks like? When we look at the use of AI in order to do protein folding, or we look at the use of AI in order to explore space, or we look at the use of AI that is reducing human trafficking, if we look at the use of AI in order to understand how to make a, a wind turbine work more effectively because it can articulate the 40,000 cameras on the 16 square inches in order to be able to make that a better design, that's a good use of AI because it's augmenting humans. 
So when we talk about ethical AI, we talk about AI that is understanding what are the social norms and the ethos and the atmosphere that we need to set up for our society to move forward. Think about how much needs to go into understanding what those standards are, what those codes are, and how to train the humans in order to build things ethically. So we start with humans. And one of the things that I got to do recently is I got to go to Salzburg, Austria, where the hills are truly alive. And I got to talk to policymakers and diplomats and, and people who are creating the policy and the laws and, and working within the system to understand explainable AI, AI that can explain where it gets its sources. I gave them all access to AI that shows its source and the very first thing that they ask is, well, who's going to win the Manchester game? And what is the stock I should buy in order to be able to become a billionaire? So yes, AI can explain itself. And if you do it right, and you know what you're doing, and you have the skills to understand what to do with the AI and with the data to put into the AI, you have about a three-month period before that human being needs to understand how the artificial intelligence is working. So we've got kind of a little bit of a long slope to get people to go from, hey, AI is not magic, it's a tool. And just like electricity, it needs skilled people in order to build that tool. So what I wanna point out is one of the, the many things that I got to create at IBM, and this is now an open group, and it's a data science profession. And it's, equi it, it, it's equivalent, if I'm gonna go back to my electricity as a process, and this is something that is open for every human being on earth. You do not need 10 years of linear algebra in order to get data science professional certified. This is something that everyone can do. And when I ran around the world trying to get all of the people to get the certification, the hard one, what I learned was that people didn't even know that they had the skills that they had. In order to show them what kind of skills that they had to that they actually had, I had to provide some form of a Rosetta Stone or translation to say, oh, you worked in the military and your MOS was XYZ. You know what you could do is logistics and supply chain. Here's how you translate the skills that you have into the skills that the job people need. So if we could empower people to certify themselves through skills and we could use wallets and LERs in order to be able to show people that they actually have many more of the capabilities that they need to have and use conversational AI to get those people to understand how to advocate with themselves because giving them a certification will not allow them to get the job and, and tell the people that they're getting the job from that they actually have this certification. So we have to do much more than just give people the certification and give people the Rosetta Stone we need to train and enable and empower people to understand how much their skills matter and are needed so that they can go through and advocate for themselves and become good employees and good contributing citizens to society. So with that roundabout lightning talk in seven minutes, um, I am now going to introduce Phaedra Boinaderas. And Phaedra Boinaderas is a trustworthy AI leader at IBM, and she is one of the most amazing humans that I have ever met. And her passion for K through 12 education is outstanding. She has a background in gaming and she is currently pursuing her degree in um, her PhD in ethical AI. So with that, Deja. Oh, it's very kind of you, Beth. Thank you so much. And I, I too am, am truly proud and honored to be part of this team. Uh, just to pile on to, to some things that Beth had been speaking about, she referenced things like, you know, her de the definition of data, data being an artifact of the human experience. She talked about things like the importance of, of really scrutinizing social norms and ethos within organizations that are curating AI. We recognize fully that earning trust in something like artificial intelligence, in particular, if it's being used for something like a talent marketplace, is not a technical challenge with a technical solution. It's a socio-technical challenge, which really, really requires a holistic approach. So in thinking about this holistic approach, it's important, really, really important to be thinking about things like 
the ethos, the culture of the organization? You know, what are the processes that are put in place? What are the AI engineering frameworks and tools? And in truth, when, when thinking about the, the ethos and the culture, uh, it's incredibly important to make sure that you are valuing uh, the uh, valuing diversity and inclusivity. So as you're looking at building your teams to develop AI in this space, it's incredibly important to ask yourself the question, how many women are on this team? How many minorities are on this team? How many varying viewpoints or worldviews are on this team? And then on top of this layer of valuing diversity and inclusivity, it's incredibly important to, to uh, to really nurture multidisciplinary teams working together in this space, right? Your social scientists, your domain experts, your designers uh, working hand in hand with your, your data scientists. Which brings me to uh, introducing the rest of the group of IBMers that are here with me. Uh, I've uh, opened up an uh, IBM Academy of Technology initiative uh, such that uh, it's not just me, but a whole swath of IBMers. I think we've got at least 25 on this call with backgrounds in de design and data science and research and anthropology and sociology and policy and legal, all just so passionate about volunteering their time and expertise with this effort with you in partnership and in collaboration with you to really do a deeper dive on how teams might approach curating safeguard rails for the use of artificial intelligence within this space. And some of the things that we're really uh, excited to be sharing with you is about how we do AI governance within IBM. Like, you know, what are we doing in order to train practitioners? How do we nurture multidisciplinary teams? And in particular, how do we use things like design th thinking frameworks such that well before any code is written, one can start to be thinking programmatically about what could disparate impact look like, what are unintended layers of effects, and, and given a potential harm, what are the values of an organization and what are the rights, the human rights of an individual such that you can design in order to mitigate for that potential harm. So these are all frameworks which, which we're anxious to share with all the partners who are, are going to be working together with us on this project. Thank you so much. I'll pass it back to you, Colin. Wow, uh, Phaedra, Beth, thank you so much for your perspectives and, and for your involvement in this team. We're, we are truly fortunate to have that kind of framing and, and experience um, to learn from and, and to think about as we consider e the aspects of design from whatever angle people are contributing to this project. And, and I think it's important to, to really highlight that is that this project is meant to be a collection of humans that are working together to create solutions that will have human impact uh, that are designed by humans. This isn't about the AI takeover. This isn't about putting things in the hands of technology tools and just letting it run. This is about being the humans in the loop and creating solutions that are going to have impact for, for each and every one of us and every every learner and worker. Um, so this is the time where we, we transition into the formal call for participation. Um, we are seeking as part of this project, individuals and teams to raise their hand, to uh, to jump into this project, to, to do this work, to be a part of this first phase of Experience U, and to sprint together to prepare for in-person technical demonstrations of prototype solutions and tools that can help create LERs um, at scale for every learner and worker uh, across uh, the United States and, and beyond. Um, so with that, we are going to be linking the call for participation into the chat in addition to the project paper. These two documents are meant to be living documents that we will update and iterate on as we collect feedback from our participants and as we learn more about this project. Um, so as Naomi mentioned in our overview with the timeline, the, these two documents and the call are really to solicit interest in project work that will then uh, be demonstrated in sort of a capstone event for this phase at the T3 mid-year meeting in July in Washington, D.C. Um, so 
for the call for participation, what are we looking for? We're, we're attacking a problem statement with possible solutions to create potential prototypes. To dive into some of the technical uh, specifications, I'm going to hand this over to, to Phil Long um, to give you an overview of, of what we anticipate being a, a foundation of baseline uh, or foundation or baseline for some of the technical pieces and uh, teams that might want to engage based on, on these, uh, these standards. Phil? Good afternoon, everyone. And let me start by saying that um, from my perspective, I'm certainly no expert in, in uh, AI, and I'm hoping that our breakout session in the technical area will allow a community to share the expertise that's out there and help us refine both the technical uh, expectations, but also possibilities that we can move forward with. But to start, as was described earlier, the primary sort of um, bare bones idea behind this is to take unstructured data in its various forms and use AI to transform those into a structured data models that re represent LERs. So the target data models that we're thinking about uh, to start are things like uh, Open Badges version three, which is in final candidate release. The link will be uh, is embedded in this uh, in this uh, slide, and you can get it uh, later if you don't already have it. The comprehensive learner record, which is just released in final candidate for version two. Open badges represents a single assertion, a statement about a person. So if one has a particular set of skills, for example, those could be put into a single assertion AI badge uh, or AI data model uh, to represent them. Uh, the comprehensive learner record is a little bit more um, inclusive in that it tries to represent both the uh, history and award of a through a transcript of a degree and also includes independent uh, single assertion badges and a third component which consists of competency uh, measures from the case framework all in a compound document. And then the baseline for all of this is a W3C verifiable credential version 1.1. That's the, main, the standard uh, that's currently out and live today. W3C calls that a recommendation. All three of those basically adhere to the outlines of the verifiable credential from W3C, and then they tailor it in a couple of different ways. But those are structured representation of educational and training outcomes with skills and abilities that we are looking for as the output of this work. The transformation of this process is through AI. We are concerned about how that transformation takes place, of course, and we'd like to have measures about how the AI performs. Something called an F factor is one of those. There are many others that you in the community can, uh, can raise and bring to our attention, but we would like to have an idea of how the AI is actually doing its job in terms of how well does it make the translation, the, the translation from unstructured to structured. And then finally, as been mentioned by both Phaedra and Beth, we're concerned about the biases and skew in the data, both in the data that comes into the AI as well as what the AI does to the data. And so we're looking uh, for various measures of the data that is being drawn from to see, if the, to see if perhaps there's ways we can characterize that, as well as the performance of the AI itself in terms of uh, decision pathways and um, what different measures of, um, of distribution of, of the data that is that is processed to indicate whether or not we've done anything that sort of, that sort of takes um, and biases males to particular outcomes in terms of the structured credential or so there's gender biases and, and other sorts of inclusion concerns. Again, the output then is on the far right we and those data models. Input we expect to be represented by any number of different things from um, potentially um, inputting pictures of credentials and scraping the information that is visible on them to text text files of various sorts to resumes represented by the docx and <laughs> and pdf rather than cdf um, files that are the typical way that transcripts have been been described before um, and an additional thing we want to be aware of 
many of you may be thinking about using AIs based on general models like the GPT-3 or, or similar. Um, that may not need training data. Uh, it's already demonstrated in general that, uh, that it can pass the medical exam and the, and the bar exams as, they, as is without a special training. Uh, but if you are using a developed narrow AI, then you may need training data. And then we need to engage with you to, to determine how much, what type, and um, other attributes of that training data that, that would be necessary. And finally, uh, I stretch interest in this case, but we will talk about it uh, to see if we can, if it works in, is the information that gets turned into skills, particularly and competencies. Um, can be described by and, and created, if you will, by the AI, but there are existing competency repositories and skill frameworks, and the Credential Engine has a repository, repository of at least 934 of these, and they do have an API to that repository, and so it would be very interesting to us if, those, if there were interested parties who could work together with Credential Engine and ourselves to map from their repositories of skills and competencies. Um, the skills that are generated by or interpreted from the input from the individuals who are those uh, personas that uh, Naomi mentioned before and make those matches and either bring them back to the individual for refinement and iterate that process and or indicate missing credentials that are missing skills and abilities that need to be added to those, fr those frameworks. So that's the general uh, uh, the sense of it. Input data is going to be from PDFs of institutions, from uh, resumes of individuals, and any other data the individual may have, have acquired over the course of their life that's relevant to their skills and abilities. Um, there are repositories that may be useful um, for, for transcripts and things like that, but we'll have to go into the details of that in our conversation in terms of what you think you need. And finally, um, we have to be sure that uh, the combination of all of these things uh, are both using these standards well and representing them well, that they are trustworthy and avoid undesirable biases, and that they are producing information useful for the person to extend their ability to either advance in work, acquire work, or find new work. And with that, I will turn it back to Colin. You know, as if listening to Phaedra and Beth was was enough, uh, the, the treat of listening to Phil go through all of this and having spent, you know, years in, in the open standards work groups to see these standards being brought to the foreground and, and considered as a, a foundational element of this project is super exciting. Um, I know it is for, for me having participated in those work groups. Um, and for many others on the call who have, have helped to make that possible, this really is bringing together uh, a variety of minds, uh, industries, and, and expertises. Um, so how can you get involved? Uh, so this is what we're really looking for. This isn't just project teams. This isn't just AI specialists. These are, we're looking for experienced people across the spectrum of, of knowledge bases. And I love seeing what's going in on, in the chat around some of these uh, the ideas around what might be analyzed, what how they might be analyzed, and what things should be considered and what, what shouldn't be considered. And that's really up to the participants and the groups that, that want to join this effort. So there are really two main ways to get involved in, in this project. Uh, first would be a project team, and this could be a complete or mostly complete team that has a technical expertise that may be working on something similar to what you've heard about here today, or maybe you have been working on uh, different projects with, with AI tools and building AI agents and, and algorithms to analyze different types of data sets. Well, that's, we're interested. We, we want to learn from you and we want to bring you into the conversation. Um, so if you are a project team or represent a project team, that is one of the, the roles 
that we are we're searching for the other is an advisor or mentor role and this could be an individual that maybe represents a team but your team just doesn't have capacity to jump into this kind of project sprint over the next six months uh, but maybe you have someone in your team who might be a great advisor or a great mentor uh, who has a subject matter expertise uh, in an area that would like to serve as an advisor to one of these teams um, we're really looking to create partnerships uh, that cross industries uh, for the benefit of our learners and workers who these uh, LERs will be reflected back to. And uh, the use cases that Naomi highlighted are really the primary use cases that we are focusing on. There are, um, you know, additional use cases that may bubble up from some of the teams. Uh, again, we are, we're very curious to learn together um, and to collaborate on creating solutions that can help bring these um, these potential pilots and prototypes to scale uh, so that we can generate you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of LERs for learners and workers uh, all over. So those are really two of the main roles for this project. Uh, the proposed project timeline, uh, and this I think is going to actually determine for many groups the, or, and individuals their ability to participate in this project. Uh, we're looking to, to kick off today which we're doing. And after today, we are going to uh, put out an interest form for project teams and individuals to signal their interest in participating. Um, from that point on, we are going to uh, look at those applications, start to form teams, and go through a pretty gentle onboarding process in terms of just figuring out what our comms tools are gonna be, how we are gonna collaborate, where documents and resources will live. And then from March through June, we're really hoping to dive into deep project work uh, with consistent team meetings and advisory uh, throughout those, those four months. Uh, we'll have a sort of a midpoint check-in uh, based on some of the milestones and agreements that we establish with advisors and project partners. And then in, in June, we're hoping to do sort of a preparation walkthrough of some of the solutions uh, that have been created through the project work. Uh, at the end of June, we're, we're going to close down project work officially and prepare fully for the in-person demonstrations at the T3 mid-year meeting in Washington, D.C. We know this is an ambitious project. We know this is going to demand resources of individuals and teams. Um, we can offer some, some, some of the benefits um, for participation in this project, our access to an incredible community such as our on the call today, but there will be a much broader audience um, across industries that are interested in, in this project and the solutions that are created and explored throughout this. We aren't expecting that we're going to get to a, a very definitive end point that we can then you know, jump to the next point. We are, we're in this together to learn and to explore solutions um, collaboratively. Uh, we have some some premises, uh, as do teams and individuals that are on this call, and we want to we want to pressure test those, and we want to explore those further. Um, so we know this is an ambitious project timeline, uh, and we have some ways of supporting teams in addition to uh, uh, the items that are outlined here today. So read through the call for participation to get more of that information, and uh, if you're ready to signal your interest, then complete an interest form uh, for our team to review. All right, so we're going to transition um, from this sort of sit and get presentation of the Experience You project into a more engaging uh, design workshop type structure. Uh, there are a number of education lab designers um, and facilitators that are on this call here today that are going to support uh, six breakout rooms. Um, so we're asking that individuals that are on this call, we're going to uh, share six breakout rooms with you. And we're going to ask you to jump into one of those rooms to engage in uh, discussion and feedback on everything that you've heard here today. And some of you may have read the project paper that was shared earlier this week. Some of you may have just clicked and opened it and kind of skimmed through it during the call today. Um, and same goes for the, the call for participation document. We want to collect feedback on the structure of this project. We want to walk the walk that we've been sharing here today. We want you to participate and we want to use that information and your feedback to iterate on our design structure and the process moving forward. So in those uh, six breakout rooms, we're gonna have a lead facilitator who is guiding the conversation, asking prompts um, and really uh, leading discussion. We'll have support 
facilitators who will be using uh, Padlet is the tool we're going to be using for collecting feedback today. And those support facilitators will be uh, taking some of that text, putting it into Padlet, and making sure our discussion um, is, is continued and documented there. Um, the Padlet is our main tool for that. So we do ask that if you're going to make a comment in the chat, that you would actually take that comment and put it in the appropriate Padlet box or create a new Padlet box and our support facilitators can help um, in those breakout rooms. So there's really three ways to participate in the, these breakout rooms. First and foremost is just like this, raise, use the raise hand feature. Uh, we know there's still over 100 people in this call. So we anticipate that there may be a lot of, um, a lot of voice um, that needs hearing. So use that feature um, to signal that you'd like to participate verbally. Um, you can also respond to the, the prompts directly in the Padlet. It's a very straightforward tool. You do not need an account. If you set an account up, that's great. It will uh, simplify a few things, allow you to save a couple of things, but you don't need an account to participate. Um, we ask at the very least, if you do nothing but listen in those rooms, that you at least use that little heart to, to signal some sentiment voting on things that you agree with. Um, and if you don't agree with something, write a comment and share your, your perspective as well. It's very important for us to create a, an environment where we can have some dynamic discussion that doesn't just include agreement. We want to dig into these topics in meaningful ways. Um, and then, of course, you can always type your comments in the Zoom chat. Our facilitators will help get that over. But we'd really like Padlet to be the place um, for us to document all of our conversation today. All right. If you have questions about any of this, once you get into those breakout rooms, go ahead and ask those questions. We know it'll take a couple minutes to get settled uh, and get comfortable um, in that environment. So we've got six breakout rooms. This is like a choose your own adventure type place. Uh, you can start in one breakout room and if you don't like it, you can leave and go to another breakout room. Uh, you might offend some of the facilitators in there, uh, but they won't even notice because there'll be so many people. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so pick a breakout room. We've got six uh, focuses are on use cases, the ones that were shared by Naomi in her presentation. Um, the, the second room will be around technical specifications, and then we'll have Phil Long leading it um, with support from Danielle Saunders. Uh, then we have our third breakout room, uh, which is uh, I'll be hosting, and this is around design criteria, design of the project, design of the just any element of this uh, project or things that you've heard today. We want to collect feedback on that and also make considerations for how we should structure some of the project work, the demonstration, like any element that you want to talk about in terms of design. Uh, in room four, we've got Dr. Kelly Page leading a conversation around the ethics of AI. Um, including considerations that should be made from the start. That I think is, a, this is a huge opportunity to design inclusively from the beginning, not do it retroactively. Uh, room five is around the human-centered design approach. At the Education Design Lab, we use a human-centered approach to our design solutions and conversations and workshops consistently. So if you are somebody who wants to talk about the design elements of this that are rooted in human uh, aspects uh, for this phase of the project and beyond, uh, that would be a room for you. And then for all of our skills junkies, I know there's some of you in the room. I'm, I self-identify as, as one of those skills people. Uh, we've got a room dedicated to the conversation around skills and how those skills are being made visible through this kind of work. Um, that is really this, the place for that. Skills has become a topic. Many people refer to skills as the currency of this new labor market. Um, so if you want to talk more about that and how these, um, how these tools and solutions and explorations might help bring those, um, then that's the room for you. We're going to allocate about 15 or 20 minutes for these breakout rooms. I know that's not enough. We know that there's not enough. It's never going to be enough, which is why we're taking an iterative approach to this design process. Um, so without Colin, further ado. Colin, quick question yep. for the group. So if folks want to go back in and add more comments to the Padlets, how long will we leave, we leave those open after this event? Oh, the Padlets are going to stay open as long as our interest forms are open. So if you don't get to contribute today, um, we're going to send a follow-up email that will have links to all this stuff, including the Padlets, for you to contribute. So if you if you don't get to be in one room that you really want to go to, uh, you'll have a chance to review some of that and contribute um, over the next week and a half. Thank you. All right. So we are going to have six breakout rooms. You're going to be prompted on your screen to choose your own adventure. 
if you don't like, you can exit back to the main room and then Taylor Hansen will be hanging out in the main room and it, he'll, he'll help guide you to the next room. Um, we know some people will be leaving at the hour. If that's you, thank you so much for attending. Uh, like I said, we'll have a follow-up email with more ways to engage uh, with this project. Um, so thank you. And uh, we'll see you inside of your breakout rooms. Thank you. Would you reshare the link to the slide deck where they can download so the links can be on their desk? Yep. And we'll make sure to share those in the breakout rooms as well. Are you adding us to the breakout rooms or do we have to choose two? I think you're going to have to choose. Oh, shit. Sugar. Sorry. Where is the, Your the room four, Kelly. Thank um, I'm wondering how we get there. Okay. I'm room four. You're not moving us to the breakout so, room. So if you if you click more on the on the bottom of your uh, Zoom window, it'll say more, and then there's breakout rooms. Right there it is. All right, room six. I'm assigned. I'm not room six. I'm room four. Thank you so much. Whoever said that to me. See ya. And if you're struggling with how to join a breakout room, you can let me know and I can, not, I can assign you as well. Uh, can you assign me to room four, please? And could you assign me to room two? All I can see is a choice is six. Can you put me, Sherry Mark, in room three? Rebecca Biusaka in room one. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Oh. Phil, I, I assigned you think you can. OK, there you go. Anybody in the main room who would like to to join a breakout room? John, Joggy, or, or Darlene, would any of you like to be assigned to a room? Or you can also just hang out and get some work done while the breakout rooms are taking place, but it's up to you.
All right, so we, uh, we're down to about 13 minutes left in our session here. So maybe we'll just do a, a quick fly through on maybe one or two themes, like literally like 20, 30 seconds, just a synopsis to share um, with the larger audience. Um, we'll go to Naomi first. Oh, I get to go first. Well, I have a group, we have lots of lists of things as, as it's important to those use cases. Um, our technical teams are really going to have to think about um, those end users and the things that we want to accomplish. Everyone is thinking beyond this phase. It, this is such a springboard into where we go next. And it's all, this ultimate goal of helping all of these use cases, as Jason so beautifully described at the beginning of the session, get into the job roles and opportunities that they need. So we were looking all the way through the trajectory. Awesome. Thank you. Over to Phil. On mute, Phil. Sorry. Uh, there were a number of questions around um, issues of the data itself, IP and privacy. Um, in terms of uh, both the source of the data and also um, when, when it's transformed and, and presented back, what is it that needs to be paid attention to so that we don't violate either personal privacy or, um, or uh, any other rules associated with, with that? Um, there were questions about uh, funding. <laughs> Are we going to provide some stipends or other work uh, support to, to the participants in this project? And to that, I said that at this stage, we're reserving the money. Well, that the we anticipate the number of teams will um, make the most profitable use of the money to support those teams attending the, the final presentation and, and, sh and sharing. Um, if there are fewer teams, then we may come back and revisit that. Um, and also that we're this phase is, as you described, Naomi, is a springboard. And so this phase is what will allow us to go after the next phase, which can presumably provide funding for implementation of some of these pilots. And lastly, uh, the question was, uh, there were a couple of questions around um, both um, inclusion of other data models and particular, particularly the European learning model, ELM, uh, which I well, warmly welcomed, as well as the idea of crosswalking um, the, across the credentials to see if how, the, how they're structurally connected together oh, so that we can look at um, uh, from CDTL to, some, to something else. And, uh, and so that was another, another interesting sidebar. Wonderful. I'll, I'll sum, summarize my room and try to save a, a minute here and just say that the considerations for design criteria are around the way humans, individual users of this would be involved in, in using, but also providing feedback and that different teams could have different approaches. There isn't one solution that, that is needed or one um, sort of structure that is going to work best, but being open to a variety of structures um, for human interactions would be great. I'll pass it over to Kelly for room four. All right, yeah, thank you for everyone in room four. We were really just getting started and going down the rabbit hole. So uh, I've shared the Padlet link in the chat if you would like to continue, as well as people in other rooms, the prompts are there. Big thing that really came up for us as we were digging in uh, is that there is already clear research that is available around the bias uh that is you know whether it be fed on information on the internet or the way that we build out skills job descriptions digital credentials and so how are we taking that into consideration um there is also about are we being flexible uh in how we're defining skills and understanding how different skills might be weighted or have uh or different even job categories or titles are weighted and have uh, bias in them we started to then really ideate what the ethics of ai means uh, for the people who were present in the room uh, in terms of how we might be examining the language uh, that is uh, potentially being fed into the system uh, and what that biases look like. But we really only just got started. So please check out our Padlet, contribute to it. Thank you so much. I know, it's such a bummer to have such a short time. We're going we're gonna to go all the way up to the half hour. So over to room five, Leslie. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks, Colin, and thanks to everyone who was part of our human centered design. You know, and we really just wanted to explore how we dig a little bit deeper into these personas and really think about those individual and specific barriers within the context of this project that they might be facing, and also really dig into some of the assumptions that we are making and be able to test and work with those learners within those assumptions. So that's where the conversation started and went, and I'm excited to continue to learn. And over to the most popular room. Who knew there were so many skills junkies in here? Uh, Tara. Yes, uh, we had quite a crowd and they were engaged and enthusiastic. Our our Padlet has a lot of comments and um, it, it is similar to what Kelly shared. We felt like the conversation was just getting started. There was so, so much more to say. Um, but some key items that came up in our discussion were around you know what types of unstructured data uh, could be leveraged you know as part of the experience you pro project and um, formatted into LERs and then also how to um, move this in how to move that data into a skills-based language the role of prior learning recognition uh, or prior learning assessment data in feeding into these LERs as well as learning that's currently in progress um, and an interesting an interesting point about how this impacts could could impact accreditation. So the fact that LERs have great promise to simplify the process by sharing outcomes data on individual learners. Uh, so, you know, interested to see what impacts on accreditation this may have. Um, and again, just scratched the surface. So thank you to all who were who were in room six with us. Awesome. Thank you for our facilitators and support facilitators. Totally agree with that comment, Kelly. So one thing that we've talked about with the this project is that Taylor Hansen and I are going to open up some office hours and maybe we should structure some of those office hours to be more direct um, design workshops around some of these topics, especially uh, based on feedback topics that that had some rich discussion that we're going that we could dive into or lean into a little more. So uh, more on that uh, in our follow-up emails. So how do you get involved? Uh, this deck has been shared with everybody. This slide has a link to the project paper. It has a link to the call for participation. And then finally, we are releasing today the Experience You Interest form. This is to signal your, your direct interest in participating in this project. If you're interested in this project and just want to follow along, you're, of course, you can fill out that form, but make a note of that. We're really using this form to solicit individuals uh, who want to serve as advisors, project mentors, and for project teams that are ready to engage in this work over the next six months. Um, we, as Phil mentioned and was discussed in their room, uh, there are, the compensation at this point was, is probably best focused on supporting uh, in-person demonstration teams and their, their teams getting to that in-person demonstration. Advisors and mentors, there is some compensation uh, to be considered depending on ability to commit to this project. Um, but if you are interested in any way, shape, or form in being involved, uh, please complete that interest form. And we are we're putting a deadline on it because we kind of have to in order to engage in this sprint. Um, we would love to extend it and as far out as as possible to include everybody, but we do have to tightly scope this project and put a timeline around it uh, in order to, to get some prototypes to work with and prepare for the next phase. Um, so those are all linked here. Uh, those are the best ways to get involved. Um, again, putting the project timeline up in front of you, we know this is a major consideration for many project teams. Uh, you may have just stumbled into this meeting today and you are thinking to yourself, gosh, we have no capacity to do anything in the next six months related to this work, but we want to. Awesome. We're glad you're here. Uh, you can fill out an interest form or you can just get information as we share it over the next six months and look forward to future phases. Um, but leaving that up, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide just briefly to share it, but I'll, I'll come back to this one because um, I know that this is something many groups are, are considering. So if you have questions, uh, I am sort of the point of contact for this, not sort of I am. Feel free to, to shoot emails to, to me with all of your questions. 
Uh, if you want to connect with any of the work that a design lab and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation are working on, um, including the T3 Innovation Network, there's some links and info for you to uh, get connected and follow along with other projects. Uh, T3 Innovation Network is doing all kinds of things across the spectrum of industries um, and innovations. So if you have not yet connected with um, the T3 Innovation Network, make sure that you plug in there. I think many that were on the call today are familiar with and are doing a variety of work across that space. Um, so I'm going to go back to that timeline and just open it up if there are any specific questions that you think are best addressed to the whole group. Feel free to type those into the chat. Uh, if we don't answer them here now, we'll, we can take them into consideration and we'll try to get back to you in our follow-up emails. I should also give a little space to Taylor. I know he's been quietly in the background uh, helping and time managing. Uh, he has been my partner in crime for this whole thing. So uh, Taylor, if there's anything you want to say or share, um, you feel free to. No, I'm just uh, excited for this project, Colin, and thank you to you and everybody else who participated today and for everybody who attended today for the, the great contributions that you're providing. And we, I'm excited for these demonstrations and for these the projects that will be, you know, uh, undertaken over the next few months. So uh, come and help us change the world as we look to generate, you know, meaningful data for everybody across the, the workforce spectrum. It's exciting stuff. All right. Thanks, Taylor. And, and with that, I just want to say thanks again to, to Beth and Phaedra uh, and Dr. Kelly Page for, for hopping in and, and presenting and, and sharing some expertise and, and some insights. Uh, thanks again to the Gates Foundation for making this possible, to all of the members of the, the Chamber Foundation and Ed Design Lab. What a cadre of labbies we had supporting our breakout rooms. Thank you so much. Those Padlets are open, so feel free to continue to drop comments in there. Check out the other breakout rooms if, if you didn't get to attend those in person. Um, share all your feedback, please, uh, and we will we'll send a follow-up email with the recording, with the slide deck, all that stuff, so you can share it uh, with people in your network and uh, in your organization. So thank you all for attending. Uh, we're excited to kick off Experience You officially today. And we look forward to seeing you uh, over the next couple months uh, in this project work and elsewhere. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.